And uh, Terry was, was my wife's counselor uh, several times out at Camp Ida. And uh, they have three children, Amanda, Casey, and Matt. And collectively, they have nine grandchildren. Interestingly enough, he's a graduate of the Maybank School of Bible Studies in 1988 and the Southwest School of Bible Studies in 1989. Try to figure that one out. That, he'll have to explain that one to you. He's done local work in Texas and Illinois, and he does lectureship stuff like all the gospel preachers do, but he's been working with the uh, Athens Church of Christ, the Central Church of Christ in Athens, Texas, for 10 years. Now, I want to tell you something about Kerry. He is, a, he is a man with a good sense of humor. And we've been working camp for a long time together. And, you know, if you hear my kids call him ugly man, he's, they're not being disrespectful. <laughs> That's a term of affection. Because at camp, he's, he's likely to go up to some of the kids and, you know, some of the girls maybe sitting over there talking and one little, two little, three little ugly girls, four little... <laughs> And, and, oh, they just love that kind of stuff. But let me tell you, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's as serious and as passionate as they come. And so this morning, we'll kick off our first lesson in our gospel meeting series theme, Heavenly, with a lesson about our Heavenly Father. Get your Bibles ready. Thank you, Curtis. Well, good morning. It's so great to be here. I've been excited about this since Chris talked to me about coming and holding this gospel meeting, and uh, I'm just excited that it's come to fruition, that we can come together this morning and talk about the wonderful theme of the heavenlies. We're going to explore that more in detail in our worship hour, so uh, we'll not go into all of that at this point, but I want us to think about our Heavenly Father, and we've entitled the lesson this morning, The God of the Fifth Sparrow. The God of the Fifth Sparrow. Before I do that, I do want to explain a little bit about uh, being the sole graduate of the Maybank School of Preaching. Now, my theory is that when I graduated, they said that they had done the cream of the crop. They couldn't top that, so they closed the school down. Now, that may not be exactly the way that it happened, but in my mind, that's the way that I remember it. No, uh, we did have some problems, and the school did close, and so I am the sole graduate of the Maybank School of Preaching. I also graduated from Southwest, as Chris mentioned a moment ago. When I went to the Southwest School of Bible Studies in 1986, the congregation at Maybank, or Mud Bank as I call it, had... Uh, thought about having a preacher training school for a number of years. Things fell into place where they thought they would be able to do it. And so I went a year at Southwest. They asked me to come back, and since they were my major supporter, you know, how do you say no to that? So I came back to Maybank and went through the school, did a year uh, at Maybank, graduated in Maybank in 1988, and then they had some problems the school closed down, so I, I went ahead and finished up at Southwest in 1989, graduated there, and I've been preaching the gospel since 1988, at least full time, and have enjoyed, I'm not going to say every minute of it, because if you know the life of a preacher, you know there's some joys and there are some other things that come along with being a gospel preacher, but I, I can't think of any... If, Somebody told me right now I could no longer preach. I, I don't know what I would do. I really don't know what I'd do. It is, it is my heart and my passion. I'm glad to see Brother David back there. David followed me at, at Mud Bank. Uh, when I left Mud Bank, he came and, and, and filled in where I was. And so it's good to see David and his wife. But let's turn our attention to the Word of God. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 10. I want us to begin in verse number 24. This is a passage of Scripture that we're all familiar with. Jesus is talking to His disciples, and He tells His disciples in Matthew chapter 10 that a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a part of that is going to bring domestic disruption. There's going to be problems in the family because of Christianity. 
But in this context, in verse 24, Jesus says, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Let's pause there, since this is a Bible class, and since we do have a lot of gray hairs in this auditorium, there's going to be a lot of wisdom. So I love to take a Bible class and just talk for a moment. So when you see verses 24 and 25, what is the point that Jesus is making with those verses? I'm sorry, I'm, do I need to stand still, Jeff? Or <laughs> okay, because I, I can't. But uh, if you need me to, I'll, I'll anchor my feet. So what is Jesus saying in those two verses? The disciple is not above his master. What does that mean? Come on guys, don't be bashful. I know Chris is not bashful. He's sitting there going, David's not bashful. I know that. What, what is he trying to get us to understand? Why would Jesus say the disciple is not above his master? He's teaching humility. He's saying, look guys, I am the master, and if you think you're bigger than I am, then you have it wrong. Yes, sir. Teaching his own authority. And so then he said in verse 25 that if they treated the master of the house like he's possessed of a demon, how do you think they're going to look at his, own, at his household? Well, we understand that. We understand that what Jesus is telling us that there are going to be people in this world who look at Christians and say, I don't get it. Do you know anybody like that? Do you know anybody that might be in a position of authority that might have the idea that Christians, religion is just a crutch. And you're so weak-minded, you're so helpless in your mind that you've got to have this religious crutch just to get through life. There's a lot of people in the world that will tell you that very thing. So Jesus said in verse 26, and this is something that we ought to underline in the Bible, fear them not therefore. Don't be afraid of them. Do we need a dose of getting rid of fear in our country right now? we got to get rid of fear, brethren. It seems like Paul would tell Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 and verse number 7, Brethren, we, not, we cannot continue to cower in fear when the government says this or the government says that. So Jesus said, don't be afraid of them, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that it shall not be known. What Jesus said very clearly is, there is coming a day when God will set everything right. These people that have done things in secret against other people, God will reveal that. I'm going to quit preaching and go to reading again. So he says in verse 27, When I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear, listen to verse 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus said, brethren, don't be afraid of the person that all they can do is kill your body. The Bible tells us, James says, that the, the body without the Spirit is what? Dead. So the body is going to die. Hebrews 9 and verse 27, it's appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment. We're all going to die. So we as Christians don't need, we do not need to be afraid of death, right? So don't be afraid of those that can only kill your body, but you be afraid of the one that is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Who's he talking about? God. You, you, if you're going to be afraid of something, you better be afraid of God. Now we know that when we talk about fear of God, there's a lot of people that are confused by that. 
We're told to fear God and keep His commandments. That is not abject terror. Where when we hear the name God, we cower. You ever seen an old cow-tailed dog? You know, you can tell that somebody's abused that dog. He comes up to you, he'll tuck his tail up between his legs, you know, and he'll slink up to you, and and you can tell he's just deathly afraid. That is not the fear that we have of God. It's reverence. It's awe. It's respect. But don't ever forget that God has the ability to punish. So don't ever forget that. Now notice... What he says in verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? Now I'm going to pause there, and we're going to turn our attention now to Luke's account. So let's turn to Luke chapter 12. By the way, these are not... uh, I don't know about y'all, and I don't know about Chris... But if I preach a sermon, by the way, I preached this at home as well back in Athens, but if you were to compare the two, they're not going to be identical. So when Luke records what Jesus said, he's not saying there is a contradiction, a disharmony between the accounts, but as anyone who has ever done any public speaking, you know you give the same speech, in essence, but there's going to be different details. So understand that this is not disharmony. This is not a contradiction. This is just Luke recording another sermon where Jesus preached basically the same context, right? So we're there. All right, so in Luke chapter 12 and verse 1, And in the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch they trod upon one another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now notice verse 2, and notice how it corresponds back to what we read a moment ago in Matthew chapter uh, uh, 10. He says, There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known, Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in the darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetop. I say unto you, uh, for it, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell, Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now listen to verse 6, and this is where we get the title of our lesson, and I think in just a moment you'll understand what all we're talking about. Jesus said, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Now watch this, and not one of them is forgotten before God. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings. So what I want us to understand, brethren, is that the God that we serve is concerned about sparrows. And if He's concerned about sparrows, how much more is He concerned about us? How much more is God concerned about us? So we think about this and we understand that the life of a Christian is a life that is guided by and undergirded with faith. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. You probably have this passage of Scripture memorized. It is one of those texts that we use over and over again in talking about God's plan of salvation. By the way, in the context, that's not really what uh, the Hebrew writer is talking about. He's talking about a life of faith. And he tells us that without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so what we're looking at in Hebrews chapter 11 is the superior faith that Jesus brought. Superior to anything that Moses brought. Superior to anything that the Old Testament prophets brought. We live now under a superior faith. But this faith is essential 
for us to live our life. So our life is guided by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. What does that mean? Walking by faith, brethren. I walk by the Word of God. And when I see things with my human eyes that distort, you know, as you get older, you sometimes have to get these things. Why? Because your vision gets distorted as you get older, right? I can't see like I used to see. And so I have to wear... So, brethren, when I am looking through physical eyes and looking at spiritual concepts, it is distorted. And I've got to get my mind to where I'm looking at spiritual things through the mind of the Spirit. That sounds like Romans chapter 8, doesn't it? I, I, I've got to get my eyesight in focus with God so I don't walk by what I see. I walk by the Word of God. Right? Amen. So we understand that. And so, brethren, not only must we believe that God is, and what I mean by that is, not only must we believe that God exists, but brethren, we must have our trust in Him. We must recognize that God is watching over us every step of the way. As a matter of fact, look at how Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 28. Not only is God watching out for us every step of the way, but Jesus came to them and said, All power or all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus now possesses all authority. The only exception to that rule is the Heavenly Father, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus is still in subjection to the Heavenly Father. And if I understand the teaching of the Bible, Jesus will continue in eternity to still be in subjection to the Father. He is now the Son. He was not always the Son. You know that. He began... He is, and I say began, He has no beginning, but He was simply, as John would say it, the Word. He was the Word. But He voluntarily took upon Him sonship. He became a son. Now you think about what He gave up in that very, just that one thought, what He gave up. And you can go to Philippians chapter 2, we're not going to read it right now. He didn't look at that equality with the Father as something to cling to. And He gave it up. All power, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I said not only is God watching over us, but His Son is walking with us step by step. How many of y'all know, knew Brother Roy Deaver? Anybody know who I'm talking about, Brother Roy Deaver? Love that man. He was one of my instructors when I was going through preacher training school. He told the story. I don't know, y'all have seen on the news recently the school explosion at New London. Happened 84 years ago. Brother Deaver had moved away two weeks before. He had attended the school at New London up until two weeks before it exploded. And all loss of life is tragic. But think about what the world would have been like if we hadn't had Brother Roy Deaver. And I'm not elevating him above where he ought to be, but I'm telling you, he told the story, when they first moved to New London, it would have been in the 20s, 1920s. They, they had running water back then, you run to the creek and you got it. That was the running water they had. So he said his job as a young child was to make sure that they had water. So he would go down to the creek, he said it was about an eighth of a mile walk down to the, through the piney woods of East Texas, you know these woods around here. Now, you go back a hundred years ago. You think they're woolly now? Think what they were like a hundred years ago. So Brother Deaver, his job as a young child was to make sure there was two buckets of water on the porch. 
He said his dad came in one night from the field. It was already dark. You know how it was with farmers sun up. Can, can to can't's what we used to say. You can work till it's so dark you can't work. That's, that's the hour. So his dad comes in, goes to wash up. There's no water. He says, Roy, where's the water? And he says, oh, Dad, yeah, I forgot. And you know how kids are. I was too busy playing, doing whatever I was doing, and I forgot. And his dad said, well, get a bucket and go get some water. And Brother Deaver said in his mind, he could see those old water moccasins, copperheads. You know, have you ever heard of people say there aren't panthers or mountain lions around here, but there are. Have you ever heard one scream? It occurred to you blood, right? And Brother Deaver said, I could see all kinds of mountain lions. I could see copper-headed rattle moccasins. You know, I could see all kinds of things. And he said, I, I, I got that bucket, and boy, I was scared to death. And his dad said, Roy, grab two buckets. I'm going with you. He said, ever fear vanish. I didn't think about any of that. Just skip down to that creek, and they got water. I want you to think about that in living the Christian life. If I look at it through my eyes, I'm scared to death. Because this old world doesn't look very pleasant right now, does it? And we're afraid. We're afraid what's coming out of Austin. We're afraid what's coming out of Washington. We're afraid of this. We're afraid of that. And Jesus said, grab two buckets. I'm going with you. And brethren, if that doesn't give us confidence to live the Christian life, I don't know what does. So Jesus said, grab two buckets. I'm going with you every step of the way. The Father is with us. If that doesn't send chills up your spine, I, I, that just, man, aren't you excited about being a Christian? No need to be afraid. Now, we understand this. One of the uh, concepts, uh, concepts of leadership is that if you, especially hear this in the military, they're taught in officer training. If you're not willing to go, don't send your boys. I, I say boys. Now, we've got women in the military, not being exclusive when I say that. When he, you, you don't send a soldier to do something you wouldn't do yourself. So when we are told to undertake a difficult task, we expect the person who gave us that command to be the kind of leader that says, I'm going with you. And that's the kind of God that we serve. Every step of the way, God is with us. He is there watching over us. God has promised us over and over repeatedly that He is constantly watching over us and protecting us. So we ask the question, do we really believe that promise? Do we really believe that God is going to do what He said He is going to do? Well, we just read two verses, Matthew 10 and Luke chapter 12, that should have filled us with enough courage to recognize if God is concerned about sparrows, how much more value do we possess than sparrows in the, eyes of his, in the eyes of God? Now, God did not send, and I, we've got two little dogs, and you know, they're, they're almost like family. We've got uh, Little Bit and Tank Tank. And Tank Tank is a tank. That's why we call him Tank Tank. He just crashes through life, you know. No. But Jesus didn't die for Tank Tank. He died for you, and He died for me. So if God is concerned about a little mutt dog and a sparrow that falls out of a tree, how much more is He concerned about us? So brethren, let's turn to Acts chapter 4. What, I, what I'm doing with Acts chapter 4 is taking the principles of Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 12, and I'm examining them to see, and don't, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, I, I'm examining the text to see if Jesus kept that promise. 
Now, I'm not doubting the Word of Jesus when I say that. I am simply saying, let's put this to the test and see, does my Heavenly Father care for me? Acts chapter 4, uh, this is a lengthy reading. I, I'm going to go through it rather quickly for time's sake. But it says, you remember that Peter and John had healed a man uh, that had been lame? You remember that in Acts chapter 3? And because of that, the religious leaders saw the popularity of of the apostles growing. They saw that Christianity was attractive to the eyes of the people. And guess what? The religious leaders of the day did not like that. Shockingly, no, not shockingly, when someone is out to get your job, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you sometimes take that a little personal, right? When someone, now think about this, when someone, now I'm not being political, but you think about when you get somebody in a position of authority that says, I'm going to do this, and does it? And the people that have been riding on the coattails all these years, they get mighty nervous, don't they? They do. So that's what's going on. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they now recognize our job is on the line. So it says, and as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them. And I, and I don't think that, Jeff, they just said, come on, brother. <laughs> when they laid hands on you, it, it, was, it, it was not just patting you on the back. They, they, they grabbed them. And they put them in the hold under the next day. I didn't even know <laughs> that they had a jail cell in the temple. But they put them in the hold. We're going to hold you over until the next day. And so uh, it was eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. It came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elder that the rulers uh, their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander now watch this and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem you talk about nepotism gone to seed we think it's bad in Washington right now this is a list of all the family and the positions of authority that they were in because they had connection with the boss. They had connection. I got 29 first cousins. Well, not all of them are living still. 29 first cousins just on daddy's side of the family. I'd have a hard time getting all of them a job, you know. But that's what they were doing. Oh, you're my third cousin twice removed, six times left. Well, I got a job for you. Come on up here to Jerusalem, and I'll, I'll get you a place of authority. So, they set them in the midst of them, and they asked them, by what power or by what name have you done this? By the way, that's not a bad question. By what authority, by what power do we preach what we preach? We better be able to answer that. And if we can't answer it, we better get in the book and figure out why we do what we do. So that's not a bad question. They're just not going to like the answer, right? So, Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we be examined of the good deed we have done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the name there means authority, by the authority of Jesus Christ, I hope this never happens to you, but if you get woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning, open the door in the name of the law. What are they saying? By the authority that has been vested in me by the state of Texas, you open the door. So what Peter and John are saying is, by the authority, by the name of Jesus Christ, whom ye crucified. Notice that. Whom he, if he's a finger pointer... And I am. <laughs> you know, he's, I, he's pointing at you guys. You guys, listen to this. You guys 
have crucified whom God raised from the dead. You guys crucified the one that gave me the authority, but God raised him from the dead. Even by him did this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given among heaven, among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. People look at us as unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they considered among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? Now watch this. For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. We cannot deny the facts. That doesn't mean we're going to have to agree with them. Boy, is this book fresh? Does that not just read right off the newspapers in our land? Don't confuse me with facts. I, my mind is made up. And by the way, that's left and right. That's left and right. You know what I'm saying. Because if we think we don't get... Well, I'm, I'm going to quit preaching. Verse 17 but that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them, commanded them not to speak. They commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name or by the authority of Jesus. But Peter and John answered, listen to this, brethren, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you make that judgment. Judge ye, he said, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of all the people or because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Remember what we read in Matthew 10 and Luke chapter 12 that Jesus said that God is concerned about sparrows, that He is not going to send you somewhere and not give you the power that you need to accomplish the task that He set before us. We see that played out in Acts chapter 4. But let's examine further proof of that. Let's look a little bit deeper in the Scriptures. Let's turn to Psalm 34. Brethren, if you can't tell, I love this sermon. I think we need it right now. Now watch this. Psalm 34 in verse 7. The angel of the Lord. Now watch this. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him and delivereth them. Brethren, do you see that? Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Brethren, this ought to get us excited. Every word of God, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. But brethren, this is my favorite. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. I know that y'all know this, because I'm talking to people who know the book. But if this chapter does not get you fired up, I don't know what will. Elisha is the prophet of God. It says in verse 8 of 2 Kings chapter uh, 6, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such place shall be my camp. So what did he say? He called in his advisors and said, We're going to camp right here. 
two weeks later, whatever the time, just giving you an idea. And then we're going to move, we're going to advance, and we're going to continue to move, and we're going to get closer and closer to Jerusalem. That's, the, that's what they're trying to do, okay? So he's giving them his battle plan, okay? This is a battle plan. What time do we quit? <laughs> well, that helps. <laughs> 940, ooh. Okay. Okay. So, the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware, this is Elisha, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. So what did Elisha do? He told the king, Don't go down there, because they've got their army ready to ambush you if you go. Okay? That's the, the idea. The king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God had told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. What does that mean? Every battle plan the king of Syria had planned, he was thwarted by Elisha the prophet. Don't go down there because they're going to ambush you. Amen? We got this? didn't happen once. It didn't happen twice. It happened over and over. Therefore, verse 11, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? What did he say? Where is the traitor among us? Step up and tell me who's telling the king of Israel my battle plan. It has to be one of you guys because I haven't spread it outside the council. Somebody's opening their mouth. You remember, I don't remember this, but I've read about it in history books in World War II. The adage was, loose lips sink ships. Yeah, we've got some that may have lived it, and we've got some that know their history, right? So, loose lips. Who's blabbing to the king of Israel what's going on? So, verse 12, his servant said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words which thou speakest in thy bedchamber. He said, you can't even whisper in your wife's ear in bed that God doesn't tell Elisha what you said. Does God care for us? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, he says in verse 13, Go and spy where he is. Find out where he is. And I may send and fetch him. And it was told, Behold, well, he's in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. They came by night. They surrounded. They compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God, when Elisha's servant got up early and, go, and had gone forth, behold, oh, brethren, we're going to finish this. Behold, and host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What are we going to do? We're surrounded by the enemy. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're almost done. Verse 16, he answered, Don't be afraid. Fear not. Now watch this. Underline it. Paint it in red. Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now I want you to imagine what that servant how he looked at Elisha. You have finally gone completely nuts. What do you mean we? Have you got a mouse in your pocket? There is an army that has us surrounded. And here you are saying, don't worry about it. We outnumber them. Brethren, you ought to... Whew, listen to this. Verse 17, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, Open his eyes that he may see. Brethren, open your eyes and see, not with the physical, because we walk by faith and not by sight. Open your eyes, and here's what you're going to see. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. Brethren, look at this. Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Brethren, do you see that? God has a hedge built around us if we are His faithful children. If God is concerned about a sparrow, how much concern does He have for us? Brethren, He's got, he's got us protected, and yet we go through life in fear. We go through life afraid that this is going to happen or that's going to happen, and we don't do this because of that. And, and we need to walk by faith and not by sight because God has us protected. Amen?
The God of the fifth sparrow. Thank y'all. I love it. <laughs> now we're we're pretty close. I only got two more scriptures, so we're good. Well, that's at least thirty more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I told him the other day I had a two point sermon. I said that don't mean it's short. It just means it's got two points. <laughs> when I was a combat marine, when they had us surrounded, yes, sir. 